Good evening once again and welcome to Our Time. I'm Vito Russo. Hi, I'm Marcia Pally. We'd like to take a minute to tell you what's going to be on our show tonight. What is it like to be a very young lesbian or gay man today? How do gay teenagers uh, deal with parents, teachers, and how are they dealt with by older gay people? How do gay high school students find other gay people their age? Where do they go? What do they do? Tonight, one of our topics, lesbian and gay youth. What about the other side of the spectrum, older gays? If you're a younger person, let's say even through your 30s, have you ever wondered, hey, I'm living my life in the dark? I have no idea what my life might become when I'm older, no vision? All our models for older people are heterosexual grandmas and grandpops. But of course, lesbians and gay men do grow older, and I think they have a lot to tell us. They have a whole history to offer about gay life in past decades, a sensitivity about relationships and about just getting on in life. But they're also beset by certain difficulties, the general problems of aging and the specific problems that come from growing older in a society that's both homophobic and where the gay culture is very definitely oriented towards the young. I'll be speaking with Chris Alvig, one of the founders of SAGE, Senior Action in a gay, gay Environment. She'll be discussing some of the strengths and concerns of older gay men and women. Later on, Mark Velez from Gay and Lesbian Youth will be on our show to talk about what it's like to be a gay teenager today. Susan Finkelstein is an 18-year-old lesbian who is now in college but was an abused child and a runaway teenager. Donald Vining is a 66-year-old member of SAGE. I'll be talking to them and they're going to be talking to each other about being gay then and now. Rounding out our show are two really exciting location features. One, Danny Soro of our time will talk to a lesbian mother and a gay father who happened to be his own aunt and uncle. And I'll be talking to film director Artie Bresson, Jr whose new film, Abuse, was one of the hits of the Berlin Film Festival and is about a 14-year-old gay kid who's an abused child and has a relationship with a 35-year-old gay filmmaker. You're also going to see some scenes from that film during the interview. And right now, some scenes from Rockefeller Center where we asked our question of the week, should lesbian mothers and gay fathers be denied custody of their children based solely on their sexuality? Stay with us. Do you feel that a lesbian mother or a gay father should be denied custody of his or her children on the basis of sexual preference? No, absolutely not. Uh, if a person is loving and caring and giving, then he or she should be allowed to have their child. I don't think uh, the privacy of the bedroom should enter into it at all. That's another part of life. If they care for the children and love them, of course they should have them. We're back in the Art Times studio, and with us tonight we have Chris Almvig, one of the founders of Sage Senior Action in a Gay Environment. Chris, all older people have certain difficulties in our society, medical bills, decreasing physical capacity, fixed incomes. What are some of the special problems that gay older people have? Actually, if you start to picture uh, older people, let's say, going to a senior citizen center, where there's the chance of enlarging your friendship network, meeting some new people that can be close to you. This might be a place that potentially an older gay person could go. However, it's the old problem of years and years and years of the possibility of living in secret, of maybe having people call you names throughout your life, perhaps being estranged from your family. These kinds of prejudicial kinds of things that happen to you through the years are not going to end just because you've hit 65, you're retired, and you don't have those concerns anymore. It's very possible that you still feel like you need to be in the closet and not let people know who you really are. So that even though you're going perhaps to a senior citizen center to meet people, you're still not really going to be yourself because you have all these years of prejudice behind you that's going to keep you from really letting people know who you are and reaching out. So you may be making the attempt but you're still changing pronouns. Oh, right. So is it your experience that older gay people are generally in the closet or generally in the closet around other older people who they assume are straight? I just think that for younger people 
my age who have grown up with the possibility of feminism having an influence on our lives and gay liberation, that it's our assumption that older people are going to be liberated too in their, in their sexuality or their homosexuality or lesbianism. And those are our needs for them to come out. But I'm not so sure that it's their needs for them to come out of the closet just because they've retired or, or been able to you know, relax a little bit more. And I think that that's one way that our service providers can really help through educating ourselves as gay people who are working in the caring community, the hospitals, social work, the counseling, and also educating straight people that, that work with the general public and recognizing the fact that not all people out there who are going to need service are heterosexual, not making that heterosexual assumption, and helping the older gay person be able to divulge to someone in the caring community, yes, this is who I am. You said something a minute ago that it's um, not the needs of all gay older people to come out. Are, um, do you meet many gay people who, in fact, that's not on their agenda, they're not interested in coming out, they're just interested in getting older in a comfortable way, but coming out is not part of that, and how do you deal with that at SAGE? Yeah, and it can be frustrating, let's say, for somebody who wants to join senior action in the gay environment, and how is it in their mind that what they really want to be is a friendly visitor, and they want to go visit somebody in their home and talk about being gay. What was it like to be gay in the 20s, 30s, mm. 40s? Well, that's on their agenda. And when they meet that older person, they may run up against somebody who needs to concentrate on, how am I going to pay the rent? I'm filled with aches and pains. Uh, I live in a three-story walk-up and can't get out. Uh, my family doesn't pay any attention to me. And I have other needs. Mm. And so those other survival needs might be more important than what I did in the 20s or 30s. Uh, just uh, uh, let me uh, focus in on what you said a minute ago, uh, young people joining SAGE to uh, do what they can. There are young people in SAGE, men and women. Could you talk about the, I mean, I, I have heard that SAGE is a, is a unique organization, perhaps because both lesbians and gay men work together in SAGE. And you have a large age range, or? Sure, we call it an intergenerational program. Um, any age person can be a volunteer. We have volunteers in their 20s and their 80s. Um, the focus is, of course, to reach out to older gay people to help them either in terms of being a client, to help them in their home or institution with friendly visiting, shopping, escort services, telephone reassurance, also to broaden people's friendship network. Um, people like me who come from the Midwest we have to leave many times our hometowns and families in order to move to larger cities for anonymity. Uh, and what happens is that we lose those connections that are so meaningful of all age people in our family. SAGE has the potential of creating this family situation so that we feel like we have lots of cousins. Don, that you'll be speaking here today, I could call him Uncle Don. You know, it's my uncles, my grandparents, and uh, it all creates this, this, um, this sense of history that some of us lack. Uh, just uh, quickly, um, that sounds to me like uh, something that SAGE could offer, gay, that older gay people could offer. Are there, are there any other s strengths, rather than focusing on the problems, or that, that you want to mention about older gay people that maybe the younger gay community isn't aware of? Sure. Uh, a few research projects have been done on older gay men and lesbians. And a lot of the research shows that if you figure out at an early age or anywhere along your adult life that you're gay, something else happens. You also start to think, well, let's see, if I'm a lesbian and I'm going to live my life as a lesbian, that means that I better learn how to turn on the furnace. I better learn how to take care of my finances. Maybe I should learn how to change the oil in the car. Things that are usually thought of as being male, heterosexual kind of role. So you learn to be independent. Conversely, the men learn how to cook, iron their clothes, take care of things that would have been thought of as female Does this roles. Does follow through as they get older? Is well, sure. Once you've, yeah. once you've learned to be an independent person, it carries throughout your life. So that when time comes during the loss of a lover, it may be unusually difficult to go through bereavement because you don't have, you know, the acceptance of society at large yeah. about your loss. On the other hand, perhaps there may be some stronger strengths than, than widows or widowers go through, heterosexual widows, 
because you have had to learn some of these roles that would have been heterosexual roles yeah. Yeah. and you come out maybe a little yeah. bit stronger. I, I think we have to wrap it up and I'd like to encourage younger gay men and women to come over to SAGE. Um, I know from my, my own personal experience it sounds like it'll be, it would give me a lot and possibly I could give something back in return um, to meet gay people of several generations. Um, a while ago, Vito, our, my co-host, uh, visited filmmaker Artie Bresson at his home. Where they looked at some clips from Bresson's new project called Abuse. It's a controversial film about a 14-year-old boy, an abused child, and his relationship with a filmmaker. It's a fictionalized autobiography about Bresson himself. Uh, let's take a look. Now, tell me what you remember about the first time. The first time they first time you were abused, how it was, how you felt. Okay. The first time. Abuse is turning out to be um, a very controversial film, mm -hmm. uh, first in the gay community and then in the community at large. Why don't you just tell me a little bit about the story of abuse and how you came to write the script? Well, basically, abuse is a story about a 14-year-old boy who is um, horribly mutilated by his parents, physically and psychologically, and how he escapes. He basically escapes by meeting a filmmaker, making a film about child abuse, a documentary film. Uh, the basic story is based on an incident from my own life. I met a 14-year-old boy back in 1975. We became friends and then lovers, and when I realized from the marks in his body that he was being abused, I took him away from his parents, or kidnapped him, depending on your point of whimsy. So this film, this controversial film, is one boy's story, but also touches on the larger abstract question of child abuse and power in relationships and where we are in America on this issue. When you, were, uh, when you had finished the script and began to raise the money for the film, mm. what kind of problems did you have with people who wanted you not to have a relationship between the kid and the filmmaker? Two kinds of problems. One, we have no money for you. Second problem was subtler, more Faustian. We have money for you if you will take the gay relationship out of the script. Here I am with a no-budget movie, $20,000 to make this picture, and someone offers me $75,000 to de-sex the story. Not just the gay sex, but any sex, and just make it about abuse, because they felt the audience couldn't understand mixing abuse and sexuality or gay sexuality. So the, the problem was twofold. One, finding the money, which I did find, <coughs> from two doctors. But the other problem was the temptation, financial, to change the script. So being a stubborn Gemini, I didn't change it. <laughs> two gay doctors? Uh, no. <clears throat> Just two doctors? Two regular doctors. Two regular yeah. doctors. Two women, in fact. Really? Who are uh, anonymous in a sense. But Has, <clears throat> this is a film within a film, is that right? Could you explain the structure of the film in that way? Well, I took the classic film within the film cliche because I felt just telling one boy's story would be a grab commercially but there'd be no way to assay the whole problem of child abuse because when you're dealing with a 14 year old the problem of an 8 year old or a toddler is different so since Larry Porter who plays me in the story played by Richard Ryder he is making a movie generally on child abuse so we watch his film being made and as we watch the film being made it was an ideal form or vehicle to put in all the interviews with the psychiatrists and the other kids and the parents who abuse their children right. so you get the macro and the microcosm by watching abuse you uh, there's one sequence in the in the film which is I think shot in Riverside Park uh, actually shot in Central Park uh. yeah where the camera is recording instances of child abuse by, uh, by parents in a playground. Yeah, this is always the real stickler for the audience. When the film is over in Berlin, where we just came back from the film festival, the people came up and said, how long did you have to stay up there to get those real scenes? Actually, all the scenes in the film are staged, scripted, and rehearsed. So uh, those are actors? They're the little kids that worked with their parents. They worked out fun games. Uh, that when we were photographed a certain way looked like abuse so that we could actually capture this. So the kids are having a great time in the sequence, but in reality, when people watch it, movie magic, people feel they're watching real abuse in real life. How old is the actor who plays the 14-year-old kid in reality? When we shot it, he was just 16. And did you... Was, is that okay? In other words, did you want a 14-year-old? <clears throat> well, 
the hardest thing in this film was not finding the right kid, because there are a lot of great actors in New York. It was finding the right kid with the right configuration of parents, who would let the kid have the free choice of deciding whether or not to be in my movie. And I interviewed many, many, many kids before I met Raphael Sparge, and then met um, the guardians and parents who said, it's up to him to decide. Right. And they let him decide, and he liked the script, so he did the film. But it was really as hard finding the parents because the whole problem of minority rights or uh, a child's rights, which is in the script, was in the actual making and casting of the film. Because right. I'd find a 14-year-old kid who was perfect for the part. The parents would meet me and read the script and say, hit the road, honey. We don't want our kid ruining his career by playing an abused child, which was the first faux pas, the first taboo. Or we don't want our kid playing a gay kid. It'll ruin his career. As it is, Raphael Sparge's career has is on the rise and this film has helped him and has not hindered him at all. Right. In the film, all of the filmmaker's friends, gay and straight, come down on him for wanting to take the kid away. Now, do you think that the gay audience reaction is going to be uh, a negative one in the sense of uh, this is bad propaganda for the gay movement? I certainly don't want to make life difficult for gay people with my films, but. I'm pretty spectacularly gay, and I don't think that's going to hurt the gay movement or gay people. But I think some people will feel that the film does create waves that they have to explain. Mm -hmm. I don't feel that we have to explain ourselves to every person we meet, because that sort of puts you on the defensive. Nor do I expect everyone to agree with me or my film. That's why in the film, almost every character says, you're wrong to do this, as my friends told me. I mean, even, even in liberal San Francisco, they said, "What? you're abusing this child, you're exploiting him, this is a power trip. And, I said, look, you've got to meet him and you've got to meet me before you can make a judgment. You know, blanket judgments are for beds, they're not for people. Right. What about the, um, the disparity in age? You're obviously going to get uh, a lot of uh, criticism by people who will ad identify abuse as a film which glorifies man-boy love. And indeed, you will probably also get NAMBLA, the North American Man-Boy Love Association, adopting this film yeah. as their own, as they have adopted other films like You Are Not Alone, the Danish film. Mm -hmm. Do you expect that to happen? Has it begun to happen I think already? It's all, I think it's already happening. I think when you make an entertainment picture, which abuse is, that has a lot of issues raised and good performances and a grabby story, people see themselves in the film. They see their lives. They identify with different characters. A lot of the straight people who see the film say it's a very honest picture. The black doctor who comes down on the gay relationship, we agree with him. So the film enfranchises their feelings. A lot of the NAMBLA people see a beautiful relationship between a 35-year-old guy and a 14-year-old boy, perhaps the first they've ever seen that's really blossomed. They identify with that. Um, for me, the picture is a story, and it's about my experiences. I think it will touch people like that, and they will espouse it. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't stop them. I don't know if I would. I mean, that's what movies are like. They're sort of a grab bag for people's feelings. Yeah, yeah. There's no, as I remember, I've seen the film three times, but I'm not sure if there's Courageous any man. explicit <laughs> sexuality. No, there's one kiss in this movie, you know. Um, and yet you've made mostly explicit sexual I've films. I've done a lot of erotic films, pornographic films, films where you see honestly the sex presented in very, what's usually called a romantic sense because there's emotion in my films. This movie is very subtle. There's one kiss, and that kiss causes more trouble than all, than all a compendium of orgasms from my other movies that people might want to protest against. And it's a beautiful kiss, it's tender, and it comes after an hour of getting to know the people. Right. Uh, it's, a, it's amazing that in America, where we can see people killing one another, that a single kiss can cause this much queasiness. But that's a cipher of our culture and our society, not so much of my film. This film is going to open somewhere around the third week in April, April 20th. Yeah. At, uh, Cinema 3 at the Plaza Hotel. It's, uh, which is amazing to a lot of people. Did you have any problems with distribution? Uh, We've had a lot of problems with this film when it first came out. It was turned down by 35 major distributors from Norman Lear all the way down to Woolworths. Uh, because they all said it was a great movie, they all felt it was courageous. I'm just quoting the letters, and they all said, we couldn't touch this with a 35 millimeter pole. This is dangerous stuff. Small distributor Promovision took on the film, and they've been showing it to theater exhibitors. And all it takes is one theater distributor who sees the commercial and the courageous potential in the film, and we're opening at the Cinema 3, yeah. where Sophie's Choice is playing, and then the Bergman film is coming in next. Hi, that was Abuse, Arthur Bresson's new provocative film. Right now, we have with us in our studio tonight uh, Mark Velez from Gay and Lesbian Youth. It's going to talk about being a gay teenager. Mark, 
I understand that you ran away from home. Could you talk about some of the reasons that made you do that? Well, I didn't run away. I just decided it would be best to leave home because there were a lot of problems I had to deal with just coming out and and at home I wasn't happy so I just decided to leave and because I wasn't happy there. Is that because you were um, coming out and your parents were coming down on you or? No, my parents don't know. I had only one person in my family that knew and that person left me and it sort of I just wanted to leave home and being gay was sort of, I was afraid of coming out at home and I was getting closer and closer, getting closer and closer. They were eventually going to find out because I was bringing literature home and... Your folks, I, you mean? Yeah, yeah. I was really afraid. So I decided to leave because I was getting really afraid. What happened to you after you left? I mean, how, how did you stay alive, get a job, did you go to stay in school, keep up with your friends? Well, when I left home that night, I went to 42nd Street and the first night and a person picked me up and I went home with him and for two and a half months I stood with him because apparently he liked me very much and I liked him very much. It was sort of, we just liked each other from the start. He thought I was just, I told him I was just doing this because I needed money and I just needed someone to be with. And he said, do you want to stay here? I said, yeah. And it started, we had a really nice relationship and he helped me a lot. How, um, do you, uh, speaking now about you and other friends that you might have your age, um, the whole question of economics, I remember from my own life, was very important in, the, in being a teenager. The struggle between wanting to be independent and control your life, not having the income to do so. Is there, is there a special problem for gay kids about money and economics and coming out? Yeah, I think it's hard to come out because your parents can either accept you and keep you at home or they can throw you out, which happens a lot. And it's sort of, you can't come out, you want to come out because you feel, I want to come out and I want to tell my parents. But then again, you can't come out because you can get hurt. Your parents won't accept it and you can get thrown out. Yeah. And it's sort of the money thing is always there. How do you stay alive if your parents throw you out? Yes. This becomes the question. What about, what about your friends? What about school? I, I had very, very few close friends, so I decided... I, I had friends at Glenny, Gay and Lesbian Youth of New York, and I decided to leave them out of my life for that time period. But when I needed them, they were there. When I decided I'm tired of of being alone. I need someone. I went to them and they were there. And it was really great because sort of I just called one of my friends and I just cried over the phone and it sort of for 20 minutes I was crying over the phone and but I knew she was there and she was listening to me crying and it was great. How did you first come to know about gay and lesbian youth? My sister helped me. She called up Gay and Lesbian Youth for me. She really called Alan Gassman. He's a member of Gay and Lesbian Youth and she talked to him. She was really supportive and eventually I called and Alan wanted me to come to a meeting. I went there and I've been there ever since. Is this an older sister? Someone who's younger left? sister. A younger sister called for you. Hey, that's terrific. That's great of her. Uh, um, uh, is the gay and lesbian youth all uh, run entirely by kids who, uh, people who are under 21 or under 18, or what's the... In the it goes like this. A lot of young people, people under 21, that we pretty much run everything. It's sort of, we get help ever so often from older gays and lesbians, but it's primarily um, 
run by young people, and it's sort of, if we need something, members of the gay community, older members, help us. But it's primarily run by many, many young, younger gays and lesbians. Together, both gay men and, and young yeah. lesbians together. Um, and what, um, you mentioned emotional support uh, before t talking on the phone. Mm -hmm. What other kind of things do, does the organization try to do for um, gay teenagers? Well, I, uh, it's sort of, it's there because we care about, this group cares about our brothers and sisters. We, we care about what happens to our, it's there because there are people that need other people of their own kind. Do, um, mainly to help other gay teenagers meet other gay teens, is that one of the? Th yes, that and support. And we hold rap groups and we just let our feelings out. We, we tell uh, what's irking us, what's bothering us, our problems. And there's shoulders there to cry on and there are people there to hold on to and kiss and hug. and. And do what's needed. Yes. Yeah. Where, uh, in general, um, quickly, where do how do gay teenagers meet other gay teenagers? You can't go to bars. You're underage. You know. I'm, do you go to political organizations, or is that really for older people? Where do you hang well, out? Well, it's sort of our political, our act, politically active members meet other younger people at um, political things, but it's primarily a lot of us meet younger people, a lot of young gays meet other younger gays in different places really. I really can't tell you where, but I've met all of my friends from the group, Gay and Lesbian Genius. Youth in New York, and I've met friends of theirs, and it's sort of, you meet their friends and they meet your friends and... It goes like that. Okay. Yeah. I think that's all the time we have. Thank you very much. I know some of these um, issues are really hot, and thanks for coming on and telling us a little bit about them. Um, Gay and lesbian youth, um, has a, there's a variety of ways you can help them, they can help you, and our, their address and phone number will appear on our screen in a minute. Uh, and you can call them if you're in the area, send them a card or a letter. Right now, I think we have some more answers to our question of the week. Thank you. This portion of our time is brought to you by Christopher Street Magazine. Do you feel that lesbian mothers or gay fathers should be denied custody of their children on the basis of their sexual preference? No, I certainly don't. In fact, I think it's incredible that that's even an issue or that that could be used as an issue uh, in this day. It's unbelievable. I think that gay, mother, that gay mothers or fathers, they have the same right exactly like every other parent. And I don't think they should deny any custody of their own children. No, I don't think that's right at all because, uh, I mean, they're just bad or good parents as anyone else. And I don't think they will teach the children to be all gay or lesbian. I mean, they won't teach weird sexuality to the, to the children. I feel if they're proper parents, everybody has a right to raise, raise their children. But uh, they have to do it in, uh, in, a, in a good manner, just like any other mother or father. And whatever in their private lives are, that's their business. That's the way I uh, feel about it. I think there's absolutely no reason uh, any good parent shouldn't be entitled to take care of his or her children. I think the important thing is that a parent love their children and give them the attention and the care that they need. Their personal preferences I don't, aren't as important, I don't think. Sexual preferences should, who, you know, who, who decides something like that? Whose decision is it to take away someone's child? I don't know. No, I don't think that really has um, anything to do with it, but if they were like flagrant types, then yes, I would say so. I think what is very important is that the children in question should be brought up to understand totally um, the principles of the relationship, either that the father was gay or that the mother is lesbian, that it's a very honest thing, that it's not denied from them. And I think in every other way, absolutely, access to children is absolutely vital through growing stages. I just think to be denied this is a very serious thing.
Not so long ago, there was a TV movie of the week called A Question of Love, which starred Jenna Rollins and Jane Alexander as lesbian lovers. And it was the really true life story of Mary Jo Risher in Texas, who lost her children in a custody battle in a bitter court case with her husband. Uh, most cases, actually, of lesbian mothers and gay fathers are not so painful and don't end so tragically. Uh, increasingly, lesbian mothers and gay fathers are keeping their children and are being openly and honestly lesbians and gay men while ra raising their children and being in a family situation. Uh, we've been flashing on our screen tonight some of the addresses of the lesbian mothers and gay fathers groups for you to get in touch with. And if you miss them, you can write to us and we'll tell you what they are. Right now, uh, Danny Soros' uh, aunt and uncle are a lesbian, and a, a lesbian mother and a gay father. And we decided to make this a family affair and have Danny interview his aunt and uncle about being gay parents. Watch. Good evening. This is Daniel Soro for Our Time. Tonight I'm going to be talking with two people who are very special to me and whom I think you'll find very special and fascinating. The topic is families. Marianne is a lesbian mother and she's here to share her views with us about her role as a mother of two children, a 12-year-old son and an 8-year-old daughter. John is a gay father and his children are the same age as Marianne's. As a matter of fact, his children are Marianne's. Marianne and John were married for 13 years, are now divorced, and as the saying goes, the closest of friends. And there's one other thing I should mention. Marianne is also my father's sister, which makes these people my aunt and uncle. Welcome to All in the Gay Family. Were you aware on, on any level, conscious or unconscious, either one of you, of your sexual identities at the time well, at least at the time of your marriage, perhaps not when you were children, but later, when you, when you married, for example. Yes, I, I certainly was. Um, but I wanted to marry Marianne and be with her and spend my life with her. And we kind of thought we would just take it and see what happened. I couldn't promise always not to act on it, or I didn't know what would happen with it. But it was extremely important for us to be together. And we had to do that. I, I was aware at, at the time of uh, our marriage, be, and before that, before the engagement, I was aware that um, he was bisexual. And uh, I also had had feelings uh, for a girlfriend in high school, and I understood the feelings perfectly. Um, the feelings for this girlfriend were not reciprocal. And I kind of uh, buried my feelings for a long time. But I understood perfectly his need to be with, with another man, because I felt I needed to be with another woman, although I, I hadn't acted on it. Um, I can remember um, the evening that I decided that I would rather live with him, marry him, knowing that there was a good chance that he would be seeing them during our marriage. I felt I needed him at the time um, knowing that. Uh, knowing he could not make any promises. My decision was, do I want to spend my life with him knowing this, or would I rather live without him? And there really was no choice. I needed to live with him. During our marriage, uh, oh, I guess uh, when my daughter was about a year and a half, um, I got involved with a woman. And uh, it was a, a brief relationship that lasted about uh, four months. And. Uh, from that point on, I knew that I called myself bisexual at the time. And uh, I knew that the feelings would not be buried again from that point on. The children, of course, are a major concern. How have you dealt with this aspect of your life concerning the children? I live alone now in the city. And I'm with the kids every other weekend and on vacations and so forth. Um, we haven't bluntly said we are gay, your parents are gay. But for years, we've been building up to that. And they know our attitudes, and they know our friends, and they know we've been in relationships with people of our same sex. They don't know the word for it, but they know the depth of feelings involved. And it will happen eventually that, that they'll just know that we're gay. Um, the timing is, is always important, but I think it will happen. When I first moved into the city, I joined a gay fathers group because I was very much um, 
wanting to know what, when do you tell the kids exactly, what day, what hour, how do they react. And it happened to be the first topic that they were discussing at this first meeting I went to. And they went around the room, and there were 18 men, and 18 men had totally different stories. And I realized that the situation would dictate when you tell the kids. And some, some were rejected by, by their children, and others were brought closer, and, and so there was such a range of uh, reactions. There are times that I think that the kids can handle it very well, and I think we've been preparing them consciously to be very open and, and loving. Um, so I don't think it will be too much of a problem, and less as time goes on. How have you managed to maintain the balance of being mommy and daddy, and also developing your own personal relationships? I think uh, it probably affects me more than it affects John, because uh, the children basically live with me uh, for the majority of the time. Um, it is difficult to, uh, to keep a relationship going uh, when there are children involved. Um, this is not true for all lesbian mothers, but in my case, um, I've just come out of a four-year relationship. Uh, it ended basically because I have two children who will always be with me, and she didn't have children, doesn't have children, and has chosen not to have children. And um, the difficulties of uh, bringing our lives together with two children were just overwhelming. And uh, for the first year or two, we, uh, we did think we could work it out. We planned on uh, living together within a two-year period of time. Um, we talked about selling our separate houses and buying a house together and living happily ever after with two children. But um, just the day-to-day -day struggles of, of being a parent, of, of spending a great deal of time with the children, of not being able to devote my life to her, of not being able to make her the only number one in my life, uh, was just too much for her to deal with. And uh, we couldn't work it out. What was the undoing of the marriage? For many years, you were living actively bisexually. And then, Marian, you began to do the same. Mm -hmm. Was that a turning point once you started to step out, as it were? Not many lesbians want to get involved with someone who goes home to a husband. Um, so in that way, yes. Um, but also, um, as I said, the last couple of years were more difficult, and I, I was feeling very confined within the marriage situation. I felt like um, I was taking on more of the responsibility of marriage um, than I wanted to. Uh, I, I felt at one point that um, I had all of the responsibility of being a wife and mother and some of the responsibility of being uh, more than that and, uh, and not too many of the advantages of marriage. And, um, well, I can't speak for John, but I, th I think the feeling was that, that the time had come. It had been a long pulling apart <coughs> period. And there was no other solution. The most gradual <laughs> breakup possible. I mean, I started to act out on being gay after we were married a few years. And I would do things anonymously and run into the city and, and just have sex real quick or something and, and be gratified by that, but also feel not so good about it. Um, and more and more I realized I had to be this gay man. And that really meant not being in a marriage, ultimately. I mean, we tried certainly to work within the confines, and we did for a while. But ultimately, we had to be not married anymore. Um, as far as the whole story up to this point, I think I've been incredibly fortunate to, to have been a husband and a father. Um, I wouldn't have changed really anything in the whole setup of the way our lives have worked out. And I think we're all at a point where we're feeling very strong and very positive and there for each other. I agree <laughs> perfectly. Um, I think my life has been great. We had a good marriage. 
for a long time. We have two lovely children, and my life now is better than it's ever been. I'm very happy, and uh, I think it's great. <laughs> Cute kids. Welcome back, and before we go any further, I want to correct some misinformation. It seems that we got the Glynny Gay and Lesbian Youth Organization address wrong on our screen. So I'm going to give you the correct address so that you can take it down. It is Gay and Lesbian Youth of New York, 208 West 13th Street, New York, New York. Telephone number, area code 212-834-0310. That's 208 West 13th Street. And now I'm really pleased to have uh, these two guests in the studio with me. It's not often that you get a chance to talk to people from different groups about how they perceive each other and what their perception of their, of their group is. Susan Finkelstein is not 18 years old. She is 19 years old and a member of Glynny, Gay and Lesbian Youth of New York. And Donald Bining is 66 years old and a member of SAGE, Senior Action in a Gay Environment. I want to start. Um, by asking you each a question about your involvement with your respective groups. Uh, Susan, maybe you can just tell me how uh, first you realized that you were a lesbian and at what age that was and what kind of problems it presented to you before you knew that there were other people your age who were gay. You know, and where did you find them and how did uh, Glynnie help you? I think I realized I was gay when I was five. Um, and so for, from the period that I was five until uh, the time I was 15 when I was ready to accept that I was gay, um, uh, there was a whole load of conflict. I was in another, Anita Bryant. I mean, I really didn't like gay people and uh, had a lot against them. And uh, then I accepted it and found a lover and fell in love. And um, from that point for about two years I lived on the street. For a year I lived on the street and a year I lived in the group home. Last May I uh, went to gay and lesbian youth. This was after I had settled myself in my own home and started college mm -hmm. and got to know people um, very close and it was like a family and uh, I felt that a lot had been done for me not only by the gay community but by the community in general uh, to help me get to school and a lot of other different things. Um, I wanted to give some back. So there are a lot of people in Glynny to give back to. And there are also very good friends there that I've made. And uh, it helps me feel a part of the community. And uh, we've done a lot of exciting stuff. Uh, we've held things for SAGE and GTA uh, have with Glynny in... Uh, GTA? Uh, Gay Teachers Association. Uh -huh. Um, so that we can intermingle. Uh, fundraisers, Glynnie is in constant need of money. Everybody's in constant need of money. <laughs> I think Glynnie is the most in need for money. Uh, and uh, how, did, yeah. how did you find out about Glynnie? I mean, Posters around the city. Really? Yeah, uh, we periodically do postering all over the place and it's really fun. We go squirting trying to avoid the cops, you know, and put up posters so that everybody can get to know us. Is it it's, it must be very difficult, um, I suppose, to an extent, for as, as much for lesbians as for young gay men, uh, on the issue of where do you go? I mean, if you're coming out of high school and you're gay and you know it, but nobody else does, and you, you're too young to get into the bars, and you're, you know, you, where do you, uh, what, do, what do the people in Glynnie do, for instance, after the meeting? They can't go out for a drink together because a lot of them are too young. Well, we do go out for drinks together. Um, <laughs> Sometimes it's a pain. First of all, finding a place for women and men to get together in the same space is very hard. Um, most, um, most of the time we just go out for a drink. We, we go uh, bowling sometimes. We go to parks. Uh, we go to the Christopher Street Pier just to be with people. Um, it's hard for lesbians if you don't want to go to a bar. What do you do? Uh, and there's age discriminations otherwise and that really bothers me. Um, Meg Christian held a concert last spring at Queens College and no one under 18 was allowed to go to the concert. Um, Why? They had, because there's a bar there and there was uh. rules. Now I understand that Queens College has to do that but I also understand that there were other spaces Meg Christian could have found. Right. So there's not a lot of responsiveness even. Well, you know, that really bothers me. I yeah. mean, it really cuts out a large section of the gay population and, and how, how are you supposed to have any pride if the only thing you can go to is bars? Mm -hmm. um, it's fun to go to cultural events, you know, and 
that was just totally cut out. Right. Let me jump to Donald for, for uh, a question about the, the, the same, actually almost the same question. Uh, is, is there sort of a, a point at which, as an older gay person in the community, uh, that there's a need for uh, outreach on the basis that a lot of institutions don't serve older gays? I mean, you might want to talk a little bit about your involvement with SAGE from a personal point of view, but what do you think it does for people who really need it desperately? I haven't experienced that because I'm not a bar person, and I, I have such a network of couple gay friends that it was, I didn't feel that, but I felt the lack of the intermingling of the generations, which SAGE has. It has young volunteers as well as older volunteers, and it has people in the interim ages. And so I think what it does in their socials more than anywhere else, but in their workshops, their rap groups, the rap groups are generally confined 50 and up. But in their workshops, their forums, and especially their monthly socials, the generations of gays mix very well and are sort of surprised to discover each other, I think. Uh, I'm very pleased with the younger volunteers, who many of whom are coupled. They're not cruising the socials. They're, they're working there, and I've heard some of them say, well, we're a couple, we're so happy. As Susan said, she wants to give some back, and I've heard people express that. And so I find it. I work both in the, on the Oral History Committee and I work on the Social Activities Committee. And I find that this mixing and meeting and seeing what new gays are like contrasted with the gays of my day and generation mm -hmm. is one of the more enlightening and pleasant things about it. Do you think it, it's a fallacy that older gays and younger gays don't have much to say to each other? Uh, I think well, I do because I think it depends uh, what your interests are. In other words, you meet in a no man's land where s sex doesn't have anything to do with it. If you're young and you're old and you're an opera lover, you may have come from the provinces as I did, you meet yeah. a younger person from the provinces, you know just what they're going through to feast on all the ballet or opera of New York or whatever it is, or if they're sports. I suppose you'd, be, you'd have that feeling if you went to the, the Gay Olympics out west, right. that here of a sudden, all of a sudden you have people of a similar interest. And then I think the, gen the generational gaps don't make any difference. I right. have lots of friends of all ages. Uh, with no sexual connection, but I'm interested in their mental development, their psychological development, or just them as people with hobbies and mm -hmm. things like that. And I think that we are a bit cut off. I know that the, uh, the parties I go to have coupled gays, naturally. They tend to be people who've been together 25, 30, 40 years. How, how young can they be when you've <laughs> had that kind of a relationship? Right. And uh, the young are very seldom mixed in there, but at SAGE they are. Yeah, that's And there unique. seems to be no animosity there. Now the people who come as volunteers to SAGE or attend the socials are perhaps different from right. the others. They come maybe with no preconceptions or they wouldn't be there. Do you think, I, I always thought, maybe Susan can, I always, you would say, well, when I was 20 or when I was 18, I didn't even know that there was such a thing as other gay people and, or that there was a movement out there. At least it must be so much better for young people today than it was for us. I don't know if Donald mm -hmm. would agree with me, but I have that in my head that it must be better. And yet I've talked to a lot of lesbians and gay men who are younger and they say, well, you might think it's better just because there's a movement out there, but it's not really. Is that true? I think it's uh, not necessarily better, but very different. Um, it depends on what you mean by better. Um, because as gay pride, kids tell their parents that they're gays and then get promptly thrown out of the house. I don't know if that's necessarily better. Uh, there's a movement out there, but it's hard for young lesbians to get involved in it. Um, because I don't know whether it's the lesbian powered authority that nobody likes to acknowledge, but I think's there anyway, that has a hold on the power and refuses to let under younger people in. Or um, whether, it, you know, it's hard for younger gays just to get involved in the movement. Mm -hmm. um, there's also uh, the issue of how to survive with all the political consciousness and how to, how to work with that and how to make being gay a part of your life um, openly. Right. And that's very, very much there. How do you tell your straight friends that you're gay and then work them into your life without segregating yourself off? The problems are very different. Um, we know that you're out there, that, that there's a movement out there, but how do you get involved in it? Um, and will you be ostracized? Not necessarily ostracized, but will you be welcomed? Which is, I think, probably more important. Right. I, wanna, I brought something up to Susan yeah. before that I right. didn't mention to you that I think is real interesting. I don't know if you agree, but it seems to me that there's a difference in the straight community and the gay community with regard to the way the ages are looked at. For instance, if 
if you're dealing with the straight community, an actor like Paul Newman or Jack Lemmon is still a leading man well into their 50s and 60s and considered a catch, whereas older actresses on the screen are, don't really have parts. Uh, they have to be 20 or 30 at the most, Meryl Streep, you know, and all these young actors. Whereas in, in the gay community, it seems to be just the other way around that uh, older lesbians are sort of revered by lesbians and seen as more attractive as they get older, whereas older gay men are not. I mean, this youth-oriented thing um, works a different... I haven't found that. No. I haven't found that, um, really, but uh, this may be because of where I go and with whom I mix. Uh, there are those who are attracted to the, el the older people and those who are not. I was very anti-age until I fell in love with, uh, while I was in my 20s with somebody 12 years older than I was. That got me out of that nonsense. And uh, I, I, now that I'm older, I don't find that I've like it. got cruised yesterday at the Metropolitan Museum to my great shock uh, <laughs> by somebody who can't have been over 30. I happened to be with my lover, so there was nothing I could do about it. But, you know, <laughs> this is very flattering. But. Uh, <laughs> Since I think people who've had older lovers are less worried about this and self kind they know they are capable of loving an older person, right. and so they don't, therefore are not defensive and think that somebody younger is necessarily out for their money, their power, their influence, or whatever. And I think that is true in the straight community. There are movie stars, uh, female, uh, like June Allison, married to a much older man originally, Dick Powell, who therefore did not waste any time after he died in getting married to a man 20 or 30 years. I think she simply <laughs> didn't have this defensiveness. She conceived it as possible. This man loved her. I, uh, did you want to? Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with the point. I think it's a real issue that um, older gays somehow think that younger gays are out to get something from them. Power, money, influence, um, be a mother, be a father. Um, I have one mother. That was enough. Um, <laughs> I don't want another one. Um, I don't want anybody's money. Right. I don't want anybody's power. And I, I want to have my own identity. You want to be dealt with. I dealt with as, <laughs> as, as an adult. Um, when I do something well and I hear, and you're so young and you did it well, I mean, it makes it twice as good that I did something well, which works out fine for me if I'm manipulated the right way. But, <laughs> you know, or I hear very, very condescending sort of things like, um, well, everybody goes through that when they're 19. Well, maybe you go through it when you're 40. If you're going through a midlife crisis, I'm going to say, well, everybody goes through that when they're 40. That's such a condescending thing to say, and it doesn't help. Um, I also want to say that I think that, um, yeah, older lesbians are revered uh, and seen as very beautiful, and I think that's a backlash to the straight, the way straight see women. In, we, in just, we have less than a minute, but I'd like you to each quickly say, what do you think Sage needs, for instance, desperately right now? Sage needs uh, lots of volunteers, and it also finds difficulty sometimes in reaching the people that they are there to reach, the homebound, the very closeted, older gay uh, who could profit by uh, friendly visitors right. uh, or coming to the socials, and they should call the social, the SAGE office and either volunteer or put themselves in touch as a client, potential client. Excellent. So I think gay and lesbian youth needs money, um, needs support, needs speakers, needs people to reach out and um, build a community with us. Uh, SAGE has constantly. Um, <laughs> And we're lucky we work in the same building, and that's really very lovely. And um, I think that we have, a, we have a responsibility to take care of our older gays and, and the younger gays who are, for right now, having trouble doing it. And uh, we're a community, and it would be nice if, if the community could do that. Terrific. This was uh, too short a time to spend with two interesting people from two different uh, groups. It makes you want to have an hour to talk about such things. I want to thank you both. This was really nice, and I'm sorry it was as short as it was. Uh, we'll do it again. I want to tell you a little bit about upcoming shows. Do you remember the transsexual character who was played by Chris Sarandon, the actor in Dog Day Afternoon, who was the bank robber's lover? Well, uh, recently, we found out that Liz Eden, who is the actual person, is living here in New York under the name of Elizabeth Eden. And we're going to have Liz on uh, in, a, in a week or two talking about Dog Day Afternoon and maybe even show you a clip from the movie for which Chris Sarandon got nominated for an Oscar and show that to Liz and say, uh, was this really the way it was? And also, um, 
we're going to, in coming weeks, you're going to see some of the best uh, gay satire in New York, including our uh, lesbian weather woman, Carla J., who will do the weather for you only in gay cities in the United States. <laughs> and please remember, as we close tonight, that more than 90% of all child molesters in the United States are heterosexuals, and perhaps we should think about not allowing them to teach in the school systems. Good night from Vito. Also uh, on upcoming shows, we're going to have a dance performance and a conversation with choreographers and dancers Bill T. Jones and Arnie Zane. They're an interracial gay couple that have been living and working together for 12 years. There's one other thing. You may have noticed that we've been having some transmission problems on our show. If you're as pissed off as we are, um, please write or call Manhattan Cable or write to us and we'll forward your letter to Manhattan Cable. If you'd like to write to us about that or about anything else, give us some feedback, a words of encouragement for our show, some criticism, please send your letters or your notes, postcards to our time, WNYC TV, 1 Center Street, New York, New York, and the zip code is 1007. Good evening, and this is Marsha Pally for our time. Thank you. Do you feel that lesbian mothers or gay fathers should be denied custody of their children on the basis of their sexuality? No, I don't. I think they should just have kids just like anybody else. They're people and, you know, whatever their sexual preference is no, you know, you know, some kids are brought up with both parents heterosexual and they're all screwed up anyway. So, what, you know, let's give the gay people a chance and see what they come up with. <laughs> Maybe they'll do a better job.